Thank you, Sandra, for the, for the introduction. And yeah, I hope I can come back to all of that. Um, <laughs> but definitely afterwards, we can open the floor and uh, I can answer questions. Um, what I would like to do, I would actually like to introduce to you our way of uh, doing a territory of foresight, um, which, as Sandra said, is a future-oriented approach. And looking into the future, yeah, it's actually the only presentation here today which looks more into the future, even though it's quite relevant to know also for policy making where the trends go, and even more importantly, what are the consequences of, of these things. And yeah, hopefully our talk and for policy makers make a contribution there. Um, the tool that we, or the approach that we have developed has been developed in the framework of an ESPON project, the ESPON project on possible territory futures. And what Sandra uh, referred to shortly in the introduction, we have not only tested and developed the approach in the ESPON project, but we also further developed it. Um, we, for example, tested the approach also in the framework of uh, Luxembourgish planning. So this was then at national level. Um, first of all, yeah, why do we talk actually about the future? Why is it relevant at all? Um, and let me start actually with an example. Um, take for example, imagine as a region, you have a policy objective to become 100% reliable on renewable sources for your energy production and consumption. Um, this is an ambitious objective. But yeah, it comes with quite some consequences. And looking at these kind of things, yeah, you need to consider not only different policies that come into play, different energy policies, spatial policies, um, but yeah, all these different things, having windmills, as in the picture here, wind turbines, means also, yeah, this has a different impact in the region. Um, so yeah, you have to consider quite a lot of things when you talk about the future. And in the morning, uh, Andy Pike said also, um, uncertainty becomes the new normal, actually. And territorial foresight is actually an approach that helps policymakers to cope with not only the complexity of looking at a lot of different sectors and the linkages between different sectors, but also uh, how to cope, actually, with this uncertainty about the future. What is the next Lee territory of foresight? Um, combination of two, two different words which do not always rely. We make actually, um, we define this as a structured process uh, to critical and lateral thinking that focus on long term uh, developments and their impacts. And we build on uh, participatory approaches and uh, we support, therefore, decision-making. What we actually do, we take uh, a starting point, a policy objective, a trend, or a vision, and we assess then which re regions <laughs> or which territories, uh, territories would be affected in this new uh, situation, and um, to what extent. So we actually assess the exposures and the sensitivities of these trends and visions. And we do this very much by a process of lateral thinking. So we, in a sort of co-creation with different experts, with researchers, with um, people <coughs> from NGOs, uh, from, with practitioners, we all combine this knowledge to, yeah, to see what does such a future situation actually mean for the territory. And in this sense, it also actually is a quite the opposite of a standard foresight approach. Uh, normal foresight approaches would have had a vision or a strategy as outcome, whereas we take it as part of, of our starting point. We start with our policy objective, trend or vision. And from there, we start looking into yeah, what are actually the consequences? What are the territory implications of this? And we look into yeah, the logical change, what happens. Um, we look at the key factors, which have those territory implications, and we map uh, this ter the territory situation. 
so now I have an example to also explain you more what it actually means to make it a bit more easy to grasp. Um, but actually, before we do that, shortly, yeah, it is a process, it is an approach. So actually, yeah, what are we talking about in practice, actually, what you want to do? So we said we put this lateral thinking and participatory approaches actually in the center of our approach. Um, which means in the beginning quite some preparation. You need to have an understanding of what are you looking into. You need to have an understanding of, of your topic, of your policy objective. And you need to include a lot of relevant uh, participants. You need to have researchers from different backgrounds, uh, practitioners with different uh, backgrounds from different territories, uh, etc. Then the centerpiece of the approach is an interactive participatory approach. Um, during the ESPOM project, we run different workshops where we actually start with framing uh, the topic. Together with the, with the experts, we actually define what does it look like? What, will, what would the future look like? And from there, we start identifying factors that are relevant in that case, and then relations between those factors. And only as last part, then we look into the territorial impact of those things. After the workshop, we have then had quite a lot of new information. So new information needs, in this case, also for us, yeah, we needed to do additional uh, research. Uh, we have identified new factors which would have been relevant. So we included that. And as last, we did a mapping of the result. And for us, it's, uh, we make there a clear distinction between mapping in the sense of making a map of Europe, but also very much uh, mapping of um, yeah, all the causal effect relations, the story around. Uh, next to maps, what we, we produce, we focus very much on the narrative. So that about when you talk about the new future, you always have the narrative to support uh, your story. Um, Looking then into the example, if we go back to, to my example of the beginning, if we have a region which has the, the ambition, a policy objective to become 100% reliable on renewable energy sources. We take this example and we would uh, conduct a territory foresight. We would start looking actually at yeah, what data is there around, what would help us, what is actually the forecast um, of the territorial situation. So in this case, yeah, we look into indicators just to give us a rough idea of what we actually look into. Um, so this is still the preparatory uh, phase. Then we start actually after we have a better understanding of what we look into in our foresight topic, we bring it on to, under discussion with the experts. And with the experts, we ask them, okay, we would have imagined you would wake up in the next morning and your region has 100% uh, renewable energy. What well, does that mean? Which sectors are, are there? What are the determinant factors that come in play? What are the indicators that are relevant? Um, and what are the relations with those two? And we did a mapping which is very similar to, to the mapping of uh, the territory impact and the territory impact tool as what ESPON already does. We, we use a lot of the elements of territory impact assessments as it was um, developed on the, on the ESPON as well. So we have yeah, a lot of information about the different factors and the relations that come in play. Um, and we also ask the experts, okay, what if you now pick from this huge schematic uh, drawing, what are the key factors that have a territorial impact, and maybe can you sketch that? And we had actually in our workshop people without a territorial background, and we managed to, to make them funny drawings. Then we helped them with a lot of maps, additional maps about specific uh, territories, about the GDP, and standard ESPOM maps, just to give them a framework of where things are in Europe. But they know relations and things that have an effect, but not always the territorial location of that. So we managed to get at the end of our workshops these sketches. And then in the finalization, in the post-processing uh, phase, we made these kind of sketchy maps out of it, which are also yeah, behind the coffee corner, the posters, they are there, which are 
more sketchy maps, we call them fuzzy maps. They actually su support the story, they support the narrative which we drafted in addition. And as you can see, they are not a standard map with nuts regions, with different classifications. But we try actually to get it out. The future is uncertain. We don't know exactly what the future is. So we try to depict rather the story in our mapping, in our fuzzy mapping, what are the key impacts, what are the consequences of this territorial future, and try to, do, to put that in a map. So having seen, yeah, what our territorial foresight actually is, how we conduct it, why should policymakers actually do it? Then, well, first of all, um, looking at the content. Territorial foresight helps to develop very integrated uh, policies. Uh, they combine the different sectors, you can combine different, different levels, um, but also very much they are an eye-opener for policymakers to think territorial, to think about these relations, to think, think about wider impact. And the second part is that they help to anticipate on the future events. Because um, we look at the, um, the causal links, the, the relations between those two, making use of the elements of the territory impact assessment, uh, those elements may help policymakers to anticipate. The second part, which makes it more um, territory foresight, a relevant approach for policymakers, is more on the process side. Um, it helps really, yeah, this lateral thinking might help policymakers to, to gain capacity. It is um, the workshops as we organize them serve as, as a platform for learning to broaden your scope. And also doing such a thing together with practitioners, with people from the region, uh, creates also ownership of, yeah, I have a policy objective, I might have a strategy, I have a vision, but what does it mean for my region? And doing that together, yeah, creates then the sense of belonging and the ownership of the, of the stakeholders. Um, there with my very short introduction to, to Territory of Foresight and the approach is how we developed it in, in the S1 project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to open the floor to any participant to make questions, please. Can you introduce yourself and <coughs> make your comment or question? Yes, please? maybe just a comment. Um, Hank van der Kamp from ECTP, European Council of Spatial Planners. And I will probably repeat it later. I just, um, uh, I'm, I'm attracted very much to the map that was, that was shown. Uh, could you put it up again? Because it is such a um, provoking map. Of course, the region here is Europe rather than, than a region. I don't know what's the territory of, that would be my question, is the territory of foresight exercise you described, was it done at European level or what was the region? But before I ask that question, I just want to say that the contribution that mapping can make to stimulate debate and policy development is very much illustrated in this diagram, in my view. It puts Ireland and the UK as the providers of wind energy, the Nordic countries as the providers of hydro, the southern countries solar, and the eastern part of Europe biomass. And all we need is a very strong grid connecting it all together. It's just a very powerful image, so congratulations on that. But my question is, what was the region in this case study? In the ESPOM project, we did uh, three different um, workshops and three different foresight topics which we, which we addressed, um, of which energy was one and we all did them at, at the European level. Um, we asked the, the stakeholders and the participants of our workshop also, yeah, they, they were coming from different backgrounds, different territorial <laughs> levels, and we asked them in the end, would you see such an approach uh, suitable and adequate also for different territorial levels at your level? And that ranges really, we had mayors in the room, we had people from national planning in the room, and they said yes. And then uh, last year we tested it also in the framework uh, of, uh, for Luxembourg, which is the national planning, and the same approach actually also worked there. We got also sketchy maps uh, for Luxembourg's planning. So in that sense, yeah, the approach would be applicable at whatever territorial level. 
Thanks, Frank. Any other question or comment? Please. Uh, thank you for that, Frank. Uh, Gordon Dabney, University of Sheffield, also a planner. <laughs> um, I'm very interested in the end, and you talk about learning. Um, after quite a lot of experience on interreg projects, which although often they weren't called learning projects, the nature of the interaction was meant to be about sharing, cross-border cooperation, very often what you'd find is the people in the room would talk to one another as individuals. But the likelihood that they would then go back into their organizations and talk to their teams and their hierarchies and change them was far less. The likelihood then they would go back and talk to their teams and their teams would actually change the organization's priorities was virtually zero. So learning's a lovely term but I wonder how within the process and how this is different, because in the end you're talking about organizational change, you're talking about strategic thinking, which at one point of time might be completely in the wrong place. Can this really learning model lead to such significant shifts? Um, no, I, I agree with you. The learning then, it always depends on who is there and is this person in the capacity to also transpose the kind of things that are said, that are shared in those workshops, in those processes, in its organization. So that, that really much depends on the uh, individual level. Um, and it would already, in the selection of the participants, that would be one of the things, uh, if you would apply such an approach, which one could think about. And it's, it's very difficult to do. Um, I'm aware of that. What we all also try to do with the approach and what was highlighted is also there before, this kind of mapping are very provocative. So hopefully it serves also as a tool that people who were there in the room, who uh, use the ideas that are shared there, that function as an eye open. Oh yeah, I've, I've been always doing very strict uh, energy planning and yeah, I, I simply don't think too much about other sectors being affected. So that they are having kind of an eye opener during those, those processes and then can use this kind of maps and tools as inside their organizations to do it. Whether that works or not in the end, that is, that is very difficult and yeah, we did not measure, we did not ask, but we hope that it works. Thank you, Frank. Any other comments or questions? Thank you very much, Frank. Really enjoyed that, and um, uh, like others in the room, inspired by by some of the things you've shown. Um, I guess two things. One is um, just the question of how, whether, how, and in what ways you use data, you crunch data, and and kind of project data forward in order to support these and reinforce these uh, visions. And then, secondly, something about how do you anticipate disruptors when they you've got two different or multiple different types of disruptor that might be underway, some economic, some environmental, some social, some political. How do you, you mentioned lateral thinking, but uh, do you use a process and how do you think about the ways those things sometimes accelerate or retard the disruptive impact of each other? Um, first on the part of, of the data, um, especially in, in the first part of the analysis, we, we looked in, in quite a lot of data just to, to get as researchers our own idea of that, what does the topic mean? Um, we're not, uh, in my case, I'm not an energy expert, so yet to get there an idea and there also use, uh, make use of, of <coughs> forecast, et cetera. Um, then during the, the part of the Tory approaches, it's very much um, depending to collect more data, and then afterwards it's to match it again. So it's it's um, not a data-driven process in that, that sense. We don't do a hardcore forecast because we say, yeah, the future you don't know. We rather would like to use on the knowledge, the expertise of the people uh, rather than, than the data, but it, it comes in definitely and, and forecast as well. Uh, the map that was here behind 
um, was uh, wind energy and energy sources 2000-2012. Uh, in the framework of the ESPOM project, we also did a few forecasts uh, of, uh, on different topics which we used. And we used also as input to the discussion. Um, but yeah, mostly expertise knowledge. Then um, the second question, how, how to combine all these things and the different fields. It's, um, we used the different perspectives, environmental, socioeconomic, more as a framework to broaden up the thinking of the, of the participants. So to, uh, and the territory impact assessment also uses the same kind of approach really to, to think, oh yeah, I might be stuck in, in one sectoral policy or in one, one field, just to consider that there is more. So there we really rely also on the experts from the, from the territory impact assessment.